Hello everyone. In the last video, I talked about a few common data formats that you will work with as a data engineer. In this video, let's talk about the data sources this data may live in. To begin, here's the data engineer definition again. Today we'll be focusing on this part of the definition, various data sources. Now in order to provide business value, the data engineer will first need to work with the data living in the various data sources. There are a lot of data sources out there, but to help introduce the concept of working with them, let's talk about a few common data source types. So let's talk about databases, APIs, and SFTPs. Starting with database, a database is really just a collection of data commonly formatted and organized into structured tables. Now an API stands for Application Programming Interface. And in the context of data engineering, it allows the data engineer to submit various requests against a system's data. Now an SFTP stands for Secure File Transfer Protocol. An SFTP client allows you to connect to an SFTP server and that hosts a directory that organizes the data or files. Let's dive into a business scenario that hopefully helps you understand very practically what interacting with various data sources can look like. So back to our favorite bagel company, Luke's Bagel Company, the data estate looks something like this. There's a database, and that maintains information about customers, products, and orders. Now this is an operational database that supports the business needs for um, selling bagels, so it can store some basic information about the customers uh, and the orders that the customers make, and it also stores information about what products um, the business sells. Now let's say the company wants to track information on social media. So the bagel company wants to get tweets from Twitter uh, that use the company's name and mentions. So the way the data engineer must interact with this data is through an API. So an API to get tweets. Now lastly, the company has an SFTP server that stores um, employee data. Now, instead of gaining access directly to the HR application, the company wants to only expose specific information to the data engineer. Maybe the data engineer um, is a contractor and they don't have permission to access sensitive HR information. So instead of direct access, the HR application creates um, a CSV export that gets stored onto this uh, SFTP. So let's approach this business scenario as if we are a data engineer that just got hired on for this bagel company. Let's say we have been debriefed by our manager and some business analysts so we have enough context to know about the data estate and what, what the company does, but we haven't yet looked at the actual data sources and the data that lives in these sources. So as a data engineer, before building out your data pipelines, you'll want to do some data discovery. I like how it was described to me once as data archaeology, so doing some excavating of the data. So let's do that together. Let's begin with looking at the database. In this database, we can find three tables, customer, product, and order. Let's take a look at the columns. Starting with customer, we can see there's customer ID, first name, and reward points. From this information, we can begin to infer that the table has a key which is the customer ID. Key columns are useful because they are unique and, in this case, can distinguish between customers that have the same first name. Because we were debriefed about the company's reward system, we have enough context to infer that the reward points column contains how many rewards each customer has. Moving on to the product, we can see that there's a product ID, product name, and a cost column. We can see that there's another key column, the product ID, and product name and cost are also very important. From an analytics perspective, knowing what products you have and what you sell them for is very valuable information. Lastly, we can look at the orders columns. So we have order ID, customer ID, product ID, and amount. An important column to notice here is the amount column. This may be a little confusing at first, but we know the product table has cost. So amount here maybe means the amount of products purchased on a specific order. Well, we'll get to that later. This table also has a lot of keys. So 
the order ID looks like the primary key for this table. But then I also see customer ID and product ID. They look like they're keys that belong to the other two tables. Now in the database world, these are called foreign keys. It builds the relationship between tables. Querying the data will help to clarify these keys and the relationships and also help us find out what the value is for that amount column or really any other column we may have questions about. Now, when querying data from a database, you will use the SQL structured query language. Um, I have some screenshots of some SQL queries and their results that we run, that were run on these tables. So the first query we can see is a select asterisk from table name. So that's the syntax for selecting all columns from a table. And this returns uh, this result, these three tables. Now we can kind of check that amount column looks like it just has integers or just whole numbers. So, and then the cost we can see that is like a decimal. So for like a, a dollar amount. So we can easily distinguish that amount here uh, means the amount of a product um, sold and the cost is that, is that dollar amount. Now another query we can run is this query. This may look a little bit more complex and um, diving deep into SQL is a little bit out of the scope of this video. So real quickly, um, what this query is doing is just grabbing a few of the important columns from each of those tables and it's actually joining those tables by those keys that I mentioned earlier that form the relationship. So the order is being joined um, by customer ID to, to customer ID to get customer information product ID to product ID to get product information. And that returns th these rows. So we can see the customers and their reward points and the products they purchased, um, the amount of product and how much it cost to purchase that product. So we can really begin to uh, see the valuable information within this database. Next on the to-do list is to get Twitter data. Let's look at the Twitter API to discover how we get tweets that mention Luke's bagels and see what the data looks like. Here's the API endpoint we want to work with. There are three components to this endpoint. The base URL, which consists of the host or domain for the API, and the version if the product has multiple API versions. And in this case, we are wanting to target Twitter's API domain. The next component is the resource. This tells the API request what specific object you want to interact with. In this case, we want to submit a get request full Twitter mentions. You will notice that there is a string of numbers in this part of the endpoint. That is where you would pass in the internal Twitter account ID, and in our case would be our bagel company. Now the last part is optional, but that's where you can pass in query parameters. These are just filters on the data, or you can select more and expand out the data object if there are more fields available. We are using the max filter results here, or sorry, max results query parameter here to bring back five results to discover what data we can get. Results will return as JSON, like shown here. I went over JSON format in my last video about data formats, and here's a great example of where you'll start to see that format. APIs commonly return data stored as JSON. And here you can see under the data array a list of tweets. This will be useful to analyze if people are tweeting good or bad things about our company. Lastly, we want to pull data from an SFTP to connect to uh, the employee data. So using basic authentication, you will need to know your company's SFTP's host name and a username and password that has access to that specific host. Once this information is passed in, you'll be able to see the file directory on the SFTP server. It looks like on this SFTP, the files are organized under the application file, then a business unit, and lastly, under a dataset folder. The application could also manage other business unit data. So for example, there may also be a finance folder under the application directory with um, datasets related to finance. But sticking with employee data, we can see that the files have um, a date and the naming convention, which will be useful when creating data pipelines to automate pulling in the daily snapshot of this employee data. Now, a few ways to interact with SFTPs. There are 
some local SFTP client applications like FileZilla and WinSCP that you can use to connect and browse through the file directory. But when you begin to build out your data pipelines, the data tool you use most likely will have an SFTP connector built in. So concluding here and doing a little recap, it's important to start to do some data discovery within your company's data state and get familiar with uh, their data sources. It's important for the data engineer to continue to grow their skills and understanding how to query and work against the various data sources that exist out there. Um, but fortunately, the different data pipeline tools um, that exist out there help connect um, to these data sources and make pulling the data out a lot easier. Regardless of what tool you use, it is important to have a foundation and some experience interacting with these data sources. In this video, I only talked about three common data sources you may work with. There are, are a lot more types of data sources than just these three, but I think after understanding these common ones, even just these three, um, will be able to help you learn and pick up other data sources quickly. Now in these videos about data engineering that I've been posting, I'm trying to explain the concepts rather than the specific products. Hopefully these, uh, hopefully these videos are giving you a good foundation and starting place, but you will need to read up on the documentation for specific products to uh, begin working with. For example, there are different types of database providers out there like Microsoft or Oracle or Amazon um, and the syntax uh, and the little nuances about these databases might be slightly different, so you'll need to read the documentation. Or, for example, with APIs, each product may look a little different in how they structure their endpoints, and each product's endpoint could have more or less functionality um, than each other. So reading up on their documentation is very important. In any case, I hope these videos so far have been helpful, and do please feel free to comment and give any feedback that you may have. Um, in the next couple videos, I hope to talk about business value and what business requirements you as the data engineer will need to follow to build out um, these data pipelines. So we've set the foundations for talking about an introduction to the data engineer role. We talked about the data and the data formats. And in this video, we talked about the data sources. So I'm looking forward to creating those uh, next couple videos. And until then, I look forward to any feedback I hear from you guys. And I hope everyone has a great day.